Yes. Good evening. Uh, welcome to the to this evening's public lecture, organized by the Institute for Mathematical Sciences at the uh, National University of Singapore. My name is uh, Tong Chi I'm the director of the institute. The public lecture series is uh, generously uh, funded by the Ngong Beng Memorial Fund, and uh, this evening we have uh, a distinguished uh, speaker, Professor Steve Evans from the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, he holds joint appointment at Mathematics Department and Statistics Department at Berkeley. Professor Evans uh, is a very, very famous statistician. He's a member of the uh, uh, he's a fellow of the Institute for Mathematical Statistics and a uh, fellow of the American Mathematical Society as well as a member of the National Academy of Sciences of the U.S. Uh, he is visiting NUS, the Institute for Mathematical Sciences, as a uh, IMS distinguished uh, visitor participating in a program that is uh, ongoing uh, this week. Yeah. Tonight, he will give a public lecture, and it's a very uh, topical, uh, topical topic <laughs> <laughs> uh, to talk about aging and uh, mortality. This is uh, from the math mathematical point of view. So please uh, welcome Professor Evans. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for that kind introduction and uh, thanks to uh, the IMS for uh, inviting me um, for what's uh, so far and I'm sure will continue to be a very pleasant stay here. And uh, thanks uh, particularly to the, the IMS support staff uh, for uh, all uh, the, the organisation that's um, gone into this, our uh, uh, our workshop and then the organization for the event this evening. Uh, and uh, last of all, of course, thanks to the, the, the sponsors of um, the, 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 the Distinguished Lecture Series um, for uh, their, their help in making this happen. Um, so I chose this quote here uh, um, from the, the Bible um, because what I'm going to be talking about tonight um, is very much to do with the action of time and chance through time, uh, time and cha uh, chance through time. Um, although uh, when I um, uh, showed this to uh, my, my girlfriend, she said, boy, that looks like a description of the University of California salary policy. And uh, <laughs> that, uh, yeah, no, there is not bread to the wise or riches to men of understanding. And uh, I had to uh, agree with her somewhat there. Okay, so we all know that, uh, uh, like in the, the Titian painting here, uh, that uh, we're, we're born... Um, we uh, mature, and uh, you know, as we reach maturity, um, uh, we uh, have um, progeny ourselves, which actually that looks like what could be about to happen here, I think. And uh, then, um, you know, after, in Shakespeare's words, we've uh, riped and riped, um, then unfortunately, and I'm now in this part of life, um, we start to rot and rot. And, um, you know, we see this uh, aged gentleman here, and uh, it might be a little hard to see, but he's contemplating a skull there. And of course, we, we um, finally die. And we're sort of so used to this that we may not even sort of give it much thought as to, uh, you know, why is it that, that things happen this way? Um, by the way, I should ask, am I speaking too loudly? I do have a very loud voice, so if it's just uh, offending your ears, don't hesitate to, to, to stop me and I'll try to quieten down a little. 
So, of course, the really sort of simple answer for why we do age is that things fall apart, right? We used to, um, as the years go by, um, the, the crockery in our house, we have fewer and fewer pieces of crockery as accidents lead to, to, to things breaking. Um, but um, the great thing about life is that it opposes entropy. And uh, as organisms, we can make repairs that if, you know, I cut myself with a knife, um, uh, I'm able to, to, to repair that. And, uh, you know, there's just this lovely quote um, um, by uh, Otto Neurath, uh, you know, the, saying what a wonderful enterprise this is, that we're like sailors out in the open ocean in a boat that's kind of constantly falling apart, and yet we're able to do a pretty good job of repairing that boat um, while we're standing on it out in the open ocean. Um, but we can't do a sort of a perfectly good job of repair. Um, there can be physical constraints on uh, how well uh, we repair things. For example, if you have um, insects and they get damaged to their, their exoskeleton, it's the sort of the same as us getting damaged to our fingernails. We can't repair it, right? It's sort of just dead material um, that's there and there's nothing that we can do about it. And also in the process of trying to repair things, um, sometimes we can make things worse, um, which is <coughs> um, uh, an explanation for some cancers, that some cancers uh, are, are, are caused by, you know, there's been insults to the body, injuries to the body um, from uh, mutagenic chemicals and things like that, and then the, the body's attempt to sort of repair them. Uh, sort of things go wrong. Uh, and of course, you know, you're all aware of this phenomenon uh, in uh, writing software that you, you repair one thing and five things sort of go wrong. And yet, sort of despite all this, life has been around on Earth for, for billions of years. And uh, the explanation uh, for that is that, you know, Rather than keep trying to repair ourselves, we do this rather remarkable thing of sort of making a fresh copy of ourselves, right? We, we reproduce, and that can be thought of as the ultimate repair. And you'd sort of think, you know, it's kind of a bit of a mystery that this is something that's, you know, much harder to do, make a, 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 a fresh copy of ourselves, you'd think, than sort of keep fixing ourselves up as we go along. And so um, I hope everyone can read the, the caption on the cartoon there, uh, which sort of, you know, because it's joking about software there, but it's exactly what uh, organisms do, uh, that uh, when things start to fail, instead of taking it to the, the shop to get it repaired, you actually buy a new copy uh, of the thing. So... You know, we want to talk about this idea of, of aging. And, of course, it's sort of a little hard to, to say how old um, uh, an individual is, right? I mean, it's not just um, uh, someone's chronological age. It's sort of how decrepit they are, you know, what state their organs are in. Uh, you know, all of those sorts of things. So we have these myriads of systems in our bodies, myriads of organs, and, um, you know, one would like to have a, a simple number summary of how healthy um, all of those things are, find some kind of a proxy um, or, or, or numerical summary for that. And a, a convenient thing for that purpose is the idea of mortality rate, and so um, probably don't need to tell anyone in this audience what the mortality rate is. Um, it's just the mortality rate at some uh, age t is the, uh, the, the rate at which individuals um, are, at age t are, are dying or, you know, the expected proportion of individuals of age t who will die in the next period of time, sort of typically expressed in terms of in the, the, the next year. And so by looking at mortality rates 
um, we get some sense of how physical aging varies with chronological age in the population um, with high mortality rates, of course, corresponding to high degrees of physical aging. This is probably not all that clear. I mean, this sort of silly little graphic here just says, whoops, go back. Silly little graphic here says dead and alive. It's just uh, meant to be giving some sense of, uh, you know, the proportion of individuals who die in a year. Okay, so something um, that, you know, if you've never thought about this um, that much, um, uh, might be sort of a surprise to you is that mortality rates increase with chronological age um, uh, after uh, the age of sort of adolescence, after maturity. And this was, this fact was captured in this uh, lovely painting that was commissioned by Carl Pearson, one of the, the founders, of course, of, of statistics. And uh, so what he was saying is that when, uh, you know, we sort of see the, this little baby coming into the world, well, death is dropping rocks on the baby, and we all know this, um, that, you know, even in modern industrialised societies, there's still high rates of infant mortality um, compared to rates of mortality um, at ages around 20 or something like that. And then uh, things start to improve um, a little uh, in uh, sort of early childhood. Death is just using a machine gun there. I don't know how clear that is. Um, and then by the time you get to um, uh, maturity, um, death just has a, a, a bow and arrow to uh, dispatch you. Uh, then you get to someone who kind of looks a bit like me, I guess, if I didn't trim my beard. Um, you know, death is uh, attacking them with an old-fashioned blunderbuss, but then start, things start to look really bad in advanced old age that death um, now has a, a, a modern rifle uh, with which to, um, to, to do its, his job. But in fact, something's more than that's true, more than just that there's a, an increase of mortality with age. Um, there's, in fact, a, an exponential increase of mortality with age. And this was first uh, observed by the, the British actuary, Benjamin Gompertz, in 1825. And, uh, you know, what he's talking about there is, uh, you know, sort of vital statistics tables um, and... You know, the word he used is geometrical progression, but of course we um, now express that as saying um, exponential increase. So he observed that there was an exponential increase in mortality. And, uh, you know, if I sort of want to convince you of this, um, you know, I hope the, the, this graphic is good evidence of that. Um, that if we look at a modern population, um, Japan in the 1980s, uh, and graph mortality rate on a, a logarithmic scale, so exponential increase will appear as a straight line, then uh, we see, you know, exactly the pic what we saw in Pearson's picture, right? High infant mortality. Um, we see this sort of little... Um, uh, bump uh, here around the age of 20 for, for men that we don't see with women. Um, and, you know, I've never been to Japan, but I'm sure Japanese young men sort of do all the crazy risk-taking behavior, drive too fast, drink too much, all that sort of stuff uh, that uh, young men do uh, everywhere. But once um, they've gotten over that, um, you do see you know, something that looks like a pretty reasonable approximation um, to exponential increase um, up to really quite um, advanced uh, old age. So a little bit about the history of this is that uh, the Romans at the very least um, seem to have known that there was an increase of mortality rates 
um, with age, you can sort of back that out by looking at uh, Roman uh, annuity rates. But the amazing thing is that in the 17th century, um, uh, in Europe, annuity and life insurance rates were generally set as if mortality rates were constant, right? So that people, you know, to the cognoscenti here, had, you know, exponentially distributed uh, lifetimes. And, uh, you know, when I say that's quite amazing, uh, you know, you think just in terms of natural selection, uh, life insurance companies who set their rates based on that would have gone out of business. Um, but that didn't happen. And for Gompertz to be able to make uh, his uh, observation really required um, the advent of the modern nation state uh, where you had a country like Britain that has a, a single central government that's able to collect together vital statistics from all over the country and, and aggregate them because, you know, where will we see this exponential um, uh, increase uh, most strongly? Well, that'll be most um, strongly present in the people of advanced age, but there aren't that many people of advanced age around um, to accurately calculate mortality rates because, you know, mortality rates are fraction and the denominator in that fraction is just not very big. And we all know statistically when we try to, um, you know, estimate fractions where denominators aren't very large that uh, uh, we can't do it really that accurately. And also, um, this is the sort of background phenomenon, but there's all kinds of blips that are messing up uh, with that, you know, sort of plagues and wars and, and, and famines, as I say, uh, which, uh, you know, all scramble up that um, underlying background pattern of exponential increase in mortality. So what's the sort of challenge to not just me and my, my co-authors, but to biodemographers um, in general, is that one wants to sort of fit this into, uh, you know, the, the general perspective um, of, you know, how we understand biological processes. So um, here, you know, it's just a picture of, you know, like every biology, every, those of you who do population biology, which is a lot of the people here, you know, sort of know that, you know, every paper that biologists write has to have a reference to Darwin, right? You get the sort of kind of consecration from Darwin that, you know, what you're doing makes sense because Darwin had an idea that you can say is sort of something like that, right? And uh, then, uh, but it's sort of expressed um, beautifully in the title of this essay by the, the, the evolutionary theorist Dobzhansky, that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. And then when we're talking about aging in particular, uh, we have this, this nice quote of Brian Charlesworth, one of the you know, great modern evolutionary theorists, uh, who says, you know, we, we see senescence, right? Senescence um, is just another word for aging, the process of growing old. You know, we see it just about everywhere, right? Um, and, uh, you know, not universal, right? I mean, there's things like Galapagos Island tortoises that just seem to get bigger and bigger and bigger, and they seem to have, um, you know, flat mortality rates, constant mortality rates rather than um, exponentially increasing ones. But... Most organisms um, have uh, this, this phenomenon of, of, of aging. And so it's sort of something that needs to be explained uh, in terms of uh, natural, the process of natural selection. So several biologists, probably starting with Peter Medawar in the 50s and continuing with people like... Uh, um, uh, George Williams sort of proposed the sort of following idea 
that uh, sort of our sort of genotypes are sort of constantly um, kind of under attack from a reign of uh, mildly deleterious mutations. Now, natural selection will oppose those because they're, they're deleterious, they're not good for you, um, but they're, they're constantly being reintroduced in each generation, um, even though natural selection is trying to, to winnow them out. And um, for many of these uh, uh, mutations, what adverse effects they have uh, are felt uh, later in life, and in fact they may even be mutations that are good for you earlier in life. Um, uh, the, one of the standard examples is having high levels of testosterone. And so when, you know, in, uh, uh, you know, for want of a better word, sort of primitive societies, having high levels of testosterone in your 20s was great, right? Because you could sort of beat up all the, the competitors um, who wanted to um, mate with females um, because you were really strong and muscular and aggressive and sort of pass on lots of your genes. Um, but now, um, you know, and particularly... Uh, uh, we, we see this in, in modern society, um, having lots of testosterone early in life um, is correlated with having uh, prostate um, cancer later in life. And so it's sort of something that was good at some time, but something that when you have it will kill you later in life. And so the idea is that natural selection won't um, oppose these deleterious mutations. Someone like me that's sort of had their three children, uh, uh, that natural selection sort of says, well, you've passed your genes on, we don't care about you anymore, you can die tomorrow, more or less, because, uh, you know, you, your genes have, have been passed on. And, of course, you've probably had time to, to read this cartoon here, um, which is just all uh, about that, that theme, and, of course, it even has a little element of further truth in it that uh, species like humans, uh, elephants, uh, uh, orcas, you know, killer whales, uh, it's uh, believed um, that uh, the fact that we, we do live, you know, sort of long after reproduction um, is something that has... A, uh, an evolutionary benefit because we take care of um, grandchildren and uh, you know, help the, the propagation of our genes by, by that mechanism. So what's the, the goal? This, by the way, isn't me on the, with the Australian flag on the top of Mount Everest, but I just thought this was sort of a good um, picture for, for someone who's achieved their goal is that can we turn this sort of informal verbal argument of the, the biologists into, you know, some actual quantitative mathematics that will, uh, you know, the, you can sort of believe from the Medawar and Williams argument that there will be um, an increase in mortality, but it's not going to get from just that verbal argument that it should be exponential, that you'd need to have a, uh, some sort of um, formal mathematical model to get that sort of thing out. And so what my co-authors and I have done is that we um, proposed uh, a, a mathematical model that combines the, the three phenomena that drive um, evolution by natural selection. Mutation, right, the fact that genes... Uh, are constantly getting altered from generation um, to generation. And, you know, we have sort of a very general structure for the possible universe of mutant alleles. It isn't just, um, you know, that you have one or two loci with one or two um, mutant alleles at those places, but sort of a, a whole universe of loci. And then we have the, the very important phenomenon of recombination, um, 
that, you know, as most of you probably know, is the mechanism by which um, uh, when uh, we're producing uh, sperm cells or egg cells, um, that uh, we make cells that are a, a, a mosaic of the contribution of the genetic inheritance that we get from our mothers and our, our fathers. And then the, the last thing is that we have a, a very flexible and, and general mechanism for incorporating um, selection, which is you know, just um, the connection between um, those mutations which you do have and your fitness, which is you know, your relative ability compared to other individuals in the population to reproduce. And the sort of model that we have is a dynamic one, which is to say that starting from some initial condition, uh, the, the genetic composition of the population is going to be changing with time from a, a generic initial condition. But it's the sort of model um, that has uh, uh, an equilibrium steady state to it, uh, just sort of like, you know, if we had um, a, a basin like that, and we drop the ball into the basin with some velocity at some position, and <clears throat> the, uh, there was friction between the, uh, the wall of the basin and the ball, then the ball would kind of roll around inside it and then eventually settle down um, to the uh, station, to be stationary at the bottom of the basin there. And so what we're interested in um, is exactly this kind of steady state. Um, and it's not just the steady state of the composition, uh, steady state of the population that we're interested in, but rather the, the mortality um, rate structure uh, that's implied by that steady state genetic composition of the population. And that's sort of not going to be something that there's a nice analytic formula for, um, but rather it's something uh, that you know, we have to, um, you know, parameterize our model, you know, sort of give it um, a, an explicit sort of numerical form and then uh, make uh, numerical computations of what the uh, steady state genetic composition of the population is and how that implies um, things about the mortality curve. And so by just going through that um, exercise there um, with just sort of fairly, um, you know, sort of randomly chosen, right, in this, the everyday sense of that word, not um, by any formal mechanism, mathematical mechanism randomly chosen, but just kind of fairly arbitrarily chosen choices of the, the sort of ingredients in that mechanism just so that we can um, do the computations, um, you sort of see that out outcomes uh, sort of curves that uh, you know, are looking sort of somewhat um, exponential. Again, we're plotting things on the, the, the log, log scale, so we're looking for straight lines. You know, we're certainly not seeing exactly straight lines. And there's some other things that come out of our mathematical analysis. One is that there'd sort of been previous models, one of them by um, someone that I mentioned earlier, Charles Worth, who'd claimed to explain um, Gompert's increase um, in uh, mortality. And um, what you can sort of see from comparing their models with ours is that their models aren't really internally consistent in the sense that one can think of their models as um, uh, being sort of simplifications of ours. And uh, again, for the, the, the mathematicians in the audience, uh, what uh, they did, uh, what Charlesworth did, was um, to, to linearize the model, um, but he sort of linearized it in a regime that wasn't uh, uh, appropriate for linearization. 
Um, and so effectively what he was doing was approximating e to the x by 1 plus x when x is big, right, which uh, we know you shouldn't do. And if you actually take his mutation selection structure and sort of pump it, plug it into our um, model, um, what you get is... Uh, a phenomenon that's called walls of death, um, which is that mortality rates shoot off to infinity at um, some finite age. Which certainly describes what happens for some organisms. As uh, you can see here, this is a, a, a salmon, uh, and that's some eggs there, and this salmon is dying. And we know that that's what happens to the salmon, right? That they all kind of, <coughs> the salmon of a certain age, come upstream and they all lay their eggs and die, you know, sort of at some essentially fixed number of years um, after uh, they, they were born. So they do experience this, this wall of death type story. So have we solved the problem? So you kind of have to worry that, uh, you know, although we sort of just chose the, the specific ingredients to go into our model to be able to make computations um, sort of somewhat arbitrarily, they did have to have a certain kind of concrete parametric form. And, you know, then we do numerical experiments and you have to worry that um, I don't know, maybe <coughs> the, the people who English isn't their first language here won't get this illusion, but uh, uh, you have to worry that we put the rabbit into the hat before we pulled it out, right? I mean, you, you, you don't want to be able to be accused of being like the, the, the magician who did the wonderful thing of pulling the rabbit out of the hat when the rabbit was always in the hat. And so you sort of think that rather than coming from, you know, very specific, specific structural forms of the model, um, that this is something that should just arise um, from very general qualitative conditions, just the same way that one sees Gaussian probability distributions, bell curves arise sort of all over the place um, without you needing to say right from the start, yeah, I'm going to assume that things are, are, are Gaussian. And uh, so this is still very much work in progress, and so what we want to understand is, you know, what's the, the, the broadest class of biologically reasonable mutation structures um, for which we can actually... Um, you know, get a handle on the equilibrium steady state population distribution of genotypes and rigorously prove rather than just do numerical experiments um, which verify that these um, distributions of genotypes are such that one sees an exponential increase in mortality with age. Okay, so let me um, now move on from there to uh, a some slightly different but still very much related topic, and that's something that's sort of much more recent than Gompertz in 1825, and that was the, the realization starting in the 1990s that the sort of Gompertz exponential increase in mortality uh, flattens off to a plateau in uh, extreme old age. So I should say something about this picture here. This is sort of estimates of um, uh, mortality rates at ages 80 and over uh, for, for females. And, you know, you're trying to estimate mortality rates at ages like 110. Well, there's not a... How many of you know someone who's 110, right? There's not a lot of these people around. And uh, so in order to have any hope of doing that, you have to go even beyond the sort of data that Gompertz had of you know, nationwide data. You have to have actually worldwide data. And so that's what's 
going on here, data from 13 Western European countries and um, uh, Japan. And even there, um, you know, there's this claim of uh, flattening out of the mortality curve. I mean, these upper and lower lines, they're error bars, right? They're indicating a... So they're saying, yeah, it kind of looks like things are, 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 are in the middle there are flat, but um, we still... Um, have a lot of uncertainty, <coughs> excuse me, either side of that. And so there's this general belief um, amongst a lot of biodemographers that this is a, a, a real phenomenon. And so we've been interested in understanding um, why this might occur. And this is actually something that we believe if, um, is even e is easier, much easier to understand than um, uh, Gompertz. Um, and that it really doesn't have anything much to do with natural selection. And so um, let me just have a little mathematical interlude to sort of set up the mathematical machinery um, that will be useful to us. It's this idea of quasi-stationarity. So I'm hoping that um, most people in the audience recognize this, this game here. Is this a game that people play the world over? In Australia, we call it snakes and ladders, and it's this idea that you roll dice, and um, suppose I'm on uh, square 14 here, for example, and I roll a four, then I go... Oh, no, it goes the other way, right? Uh, let's see what's... Uh, yeah, suppose I'm on square uh, 12 here and I roll a 3. Well, I go to square 15 and then I climb up the ladder um, to square 34. On the other hand, um, if I was on square 56 here and I rolled a 2, I'd slide um, all the way down um, to the starting square on the stake. And the aim is to uh, eventually reach square 100. And the observation is that suppose I was um, just playing this game by myself for, for simplicity, and I'd you know, been playing for um, you know, dozens after dozens of rolls, and I hadn't hit square 100, then uh, knowing that information, the, the probability that I'd assigned to be on square i that will have settled down to some number pi i, right? Um, doesn't matter what it is, there'll just be some number that it will have settled down to, right? That if uh, I know that I've, you know, played the game for 100 rolls and I haven't finished it, the knowing that information, um, the probability that I'd assign to being, say, on square 76, um, would be the same as the probability that I'd assigned to being on square 76 if I'd been playing the game for a thousand rolls and um, hadn't reached a hundred yet. And so that's called phenomenon is called quasi-stationarity, that knowing that you haven't finished the game um, tells you that you're going to be in an equilibrium situation. And so what that means is that if I know that I've played the game for a large number of roles and I haven't got to the end yet, uh, then the probability that I do get to the end on the next roll is just going to be given to me. And I, I think this is the only uh, formula in the, uh, the, the talk, so I, I beg your uh, forbearance for that is going to be given by um, this expression here. We just sum up um, over every choice of the square i that we're going to be in the probability, this conditional probability that we're in that square multiplied by the probability that on the next roll we go from square i to square 100 and finish the game. So everything clear with, with that? I sort of... And so... I claim that sort of quasi-stationarity actually explains mortality plateaus. Apologies to the French speakers in the audience that uh, 
the I know this is not how you're supposed to turn plateau into a plural, but uh, uh, journal editors think it is, so uh, uh, that's that's why it's spelt like that. And so, reproductive fitness, right, is not something that's an issue for a hundred plus year olds, right? They're not um, actively reproducing, and so questions of natural selection are not really germane here. Uh, and if you've reached an advanced um, age like this, you're in some kind of quasi-stationary equilibrium, right? That uh, you know your 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 organs are uh, in, in in some kind of equilibrium uh, in this sort of conditional situation, of knowing that you're at this advanced age, um, but uh, you 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 haven't. Uh, um, uh, uh, died yet, and um, so because of this observation that we had on the previous slide, uh, the the day to day probability of you finishing the game, which in this setting means dying, um, is, is settled down to a, a constant, and that's exactly what we mean by um, uh, having a, a mortality plateau, and so. On the one hand here we have what we believe is a valid and it's certainly a, a simple explanation for um, mortality plateaus. And there's also a lesson to take away from this because you'll actually see quite a few papers out in the literature um, where they do this insidious kind of reverse engineering where they have a fancy model that leads to mortality plateaus and then they sort of say, ah, we see mortality plateaus, therefore our model has to be right. And this kind of reasoning indicates that that's actually um, not very strong probative evidence um, for having a, a, a model that um, captures uh, the, the aging process. Whereas capturing uh, something like Gompertz, um, I think, is much stronger um, evidence uh, <coughs> that um, you are getting a handle on, you know, what's going on um, behind aging. Okay, and let me um, finally um, finish off uh, with uh, yet another slight twist on this story, and that's work that we did on uh, aging in in bacteria. And so the basis of this is these really cool experiments that people are able to do now where you can take uh, sort of organisms like uh, E. coli bacteria or various species of yeast um, and uh, actually assay in a non-destructive way how healthy those cells are, how much um, uh, cellular damage um, there there is in them, how much the DNA is degraded, that sort of thing. And so it's really like um, uh, you know this lady Jane Goodall, who does the well, she's sort of quite old herself now, and so she doesn't I think do it actively. But, you know, she used to do all the studies on chimpanzees, right? So she'd just go and sit there um, and, you know, look at the chimpanzees through binoculars and, you know, write down, uh, you know, Fred did this today and Fred interacted with Jane and all this sort of stuff. Well, people can do this with bacteria now, that they can sort of see how healthy a bacterium is and then they can see that bacterium split and follow the, the two children, the two daughter um, bacteria, and how healthy they are, and, and so on and so on. And it's sort of, you know, sort of really quite remarkable with um, uh, the, sort of what the, the technology allows now. And the degree of um, sort of damage uh, that a, a cell has 
um, first of all affects the rate at which it tries to split. Um, it'll uh, uh, try to split more slowly if there's a lot of damage. And if there's a lot of damage when it tries to split, um, it won't be able to split successfully. It'll just die rather than splitting successfully. And the, the interesting thing that people have observed is that when an individual does split, split, the damage is not shared equally among the two daughter cells. So, uh, you know, I've got, uh, well, I've got three children, but in particular, I've got uh, twin sons. And it's sort of like when they go off to college, uh, well, which they've done, uh, you know, do I give one guy, you know, all the junky broken furniture that we've got around the house and give his brother nice new stuff that we've gone off to Ikea or somewhere like that and bought? Or do we sort of mix things up and sort of share it out equally? And so um, the sort of question arises is, you know, is there actually some advantage to having a, a particular strategy for how you're going to share um, the, the amount of damaged material out. So what happens is that, uh, you know, when a shell, the cell splits, um, there's going to be uh, this sort of mixture of damaged material and new material. And you put all the damaged material in one daughter cell, all the new material, the fresh stuff, in another daughter cell, or do you mix stuff up? And uh, does a particular strategy of doing that um, have an, an evolutionary advantage in the sense of it um, increasing uh, the, the, the rate at which the, the, the population grows? And here's just sort of a picture. I don't know why this looks so bad, but um, it's uh, the colors here, the, the damaged cells are the ones that are uh, in sort of the, the orange color where the, the more pristine cells are the, the green ones. And so here's the kind of picture that we sort of start up here at some time. And here we're just imagining that, you know, here's damage on this axis measured in, you know, damage is somehow being boiled down to a single numerical quantity. And we have damage sort of just increasing linearly uh, with time. And sort of what we see here is um, that the more damaged cells take longer uh, before they uh, try to split. And they're less likely um, to, to split successfully. Whereas the, the cells with a small amount of damage, they um, uh, split uh, quite rapidly and tend to split successfully. So the sort of analysis that we did, um, I don't know why I put in there, I guess I was just wanting to sound impressive by saying that we had a stochastic partial, because, you know, I'm not <laughs> going to actually write what it was, right, but sounds good, doesn't it, yeah. Um, but you know, by a, a, a sort of a reasonable mathematical model. Um, we proved that there's actually, um, you know, in the model, uh, 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 an optimal uh, level of, of segregation that, um, you know, here we're, we're plotting um, sort of a degree of damage segregation, so going from uh, there um, being sort of complete symmetry um, in uh, damage sharing um, up to um, something that's very asymmetric. And what one sees is that for intermediate uh, levels of the, the damage segregation, um, you get uh, the, the optimal level of population growth. And so it sort of suggests that there is some merit um, in segregating damage, but not um, uh, segregating it too strongly. 
And it's just sort of something cute here that in the, the analysis of this, um, it was sort of very critical that we actually use uh, a particular 19th century um, special function, um, the, the airy functions. There's uh, uh, two different kinds of airy functions called very uh, kind of creatively A and B. And, uh, and so they were invented by this guy who was the, the astronomer royal, uh, so the astronomer to the queen, Queen Victoria. Um, and, you know, he, he invented them uh, to describe uh, what a, a, a point source of, of light, a, a star, is actually going to look like when you look through the, the lens of a telescope, that there'll be these kind of concentric rings instead of just a nice clear um, uh, uh, image. And so he invented them for that purpose. And uh, they just turned out to be um, you know, indispensable to us in uh, uh, analysing what was going on in our model. And oops... And so, uh, you know, I love this, this title here, um, you know, that I think all of us in the audience who are mathematicians have sort of experienced, if we've ever sort of done anything um, that sort of involves biology or physics or something like that, um, that uh, something that was sort of invented for a completely different um, purpose mathematically turns out to be just the right ingredient, the right tool, the right object, um, that you need uh, to do a, a, a particular piece of analysis. So let me sort of say a little bit, um, kind of wax philosophically, about the, the, the role of mathematics in biology. And so that was addressed by um, uh, uh, Schrodinger. You know, I guess when you're someone like Schrodinger, you can actually have the, the chutzpah um, to, you know, write a book with the title, What is Life, right? I mean, you know, you've got to, you've got to feel pretty confident about your, your, your place in the intellectual firmament to be able to do that. And, you know, he had this lovely quote, though, that, you know, the, the reason why there's not more mathematics in biology um, is not because biology is so simple, but rather because, you know, it's, it's so complex. And, uh, but that sort of attitude, I think, is, is, is changing a lot. Um, I, you know, there was this very provocative title, um, this essay by, by Cohen, saying, you know, mathematics is biology's next microscope, only better. Biology is mathematics' next physics, only better, that, you know, somehow... Uh, Physics is what gave mathematics this whole source of interesting problems during the, the 20th century, and in the 21st century, it's going to be biology that's going to play that role. Um, I'd sort of say uh, sort of a few things about that. I'm not sure that questions in biology are going to play the role of physics in the sense of developing whole new fields of mathematics, just in the way that quantum mechanics led to incredible developments in uh, operator theory, functional analysis. Um, however, just in my own sort of very, uh, uh, you know, modest work, I've just been sort of amazed how you just find the need for all sorts of different um, disparate pieces of mathematics that, you know, in problems in phylogenetics that sort of come up that I've used facts about representation theory of, of finite groups. I mean, and it's just exactly the right tool um, to use. Um, but of course, you know, we shouldn't study, you know, this is a, a truism that probably most of you will agree with, but I think it still needs to be said, um, that we should study questions from biology because they're the important and interesting questions in their own right for biology, but of course it's always a good thing if the mathematics is appealing. And then I couldn't help but 
um, sort of depart with a, a, a final warning uh, about you know, the, the dangers of mathematical modeling in general is that it's something that can make us feel good, make us feel that we've understand what's going on when, when really it hasn't. So um, it's just saying that uh, some explanations, some models <coughs> uh, uh, are like um, painkillers, which uh, you know make you uh, you know dull the, the sharpness of not understanding things, um, but don't really solve the, the the underlying disease. Right? Don't actually get you uh, to an understanding. And so, with that, I'd just like to thank um, the the two co-authors who. Um, came along with me for everything that I um, talked about uh, uh, the, this evening. Um, David Steinsaltz, who's uh, uh, at Oxford and who I borrowed um, several of the, the graphics and um, even some of the text from uh, on the slides. And uh, Ken Wachter, um, the biodemographer, uh, who got both um, David and I uh, thinking about ageing, and um, lastly, of course, um, uh, support from the funding agencies from the National Science Foundation and the National Institute of Health, who, through grant support, um, help make um, a lot of this research possible. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Evans, yes. for a very interesting talk. Um, any questions or comments? Mm. I have one question. Yeah. If you have a population which consists of two groups of people, both, in both the mortality increases exponentially, but in one group it increases faster than in the other, would that, if you mix these and you observe them as a whole, it also results in a flattening out? Um. Would you see a flattening out just because of doing that mixture? I'm thinking so, because when you go to old age, you're more likely to see those people for which mortality grows slower. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
general principles uh, which would explain the Comfort's curve are right. very fascinating. Can one, uh, and you said this is, this is on the way, right? This is not well, that's, that's our sort of hope that we're still... Uh, yeah, and can one, can you indicate already some some kinds of uh, of principles that would uh, that would uh, be ingredients of this whole or is it No, I mean we just don't know what it is that sort of drives this, right? Because you know, uh, you know, again, I sort of don't want to sound fancy, but the uh, the 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 population. Um, uh, uh, the genetic composition of the population, uh, you know, as a mathematical object in our story, is a it's a measure, right, on the space of genotypes, and then you have mm -hmm. dynamics. So what you have mm -hmm. sort of is an infinite dimensional. Uh, uh, measure value dynamical system and you're sort of talking about uh, uh, equilibria of that thing and it's not just getting a handle on the equilibria you then want to back out of that what that plot implies about um, mortality curves because the equilibrium is at the level of genetic composition of the population in steady state and we just don't seem to have the tools to be able to, to do that. We, we can prove that there's equilibria and, you know, you give us a particular instantiation of our model and we sort of, in numerical form, and we know how to compute what the equilibrium is, but we, in terms of doing any sort of analysis, we, we're sort of stuck at not being able to do that. So it's certainly a challenge that I hope other people will, will take up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I was wondering about the um, segregation parameter you had. Um, was yeah. that any what, what you predicted from the model or what you found from the model? Was that close to what was observed? If you can observe a single number, then sort of quantified damage and how far? No. So we, we, we talk in the paper about how this might inform experiments, but we sort of didn't sort of do it at the level of um, matching number for number, but rather you know, do you, do you sort of see as, because you don't sort of really have any con experimental control over um, how the cells are doing their, 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 their segregation. Yeah, so I got it, that tour is actually sort of something like a, a, a kind of like a variance parameter. It's sort of a bit weird the way that it appears. It's, it's not, um, just uh, this sort of simple split thing. I mean, I can later show you the, the, the paper and show you where, where it appears. And so it's, yeah, you know, I mean, the actual value there was 1.75 that is sort of on this sort of scale where it goes from zero up to 10. So I can't actually, to be honest, sort of really even really remember how it's defined now. So you know, why it isn't between zero and one with a half being uh, uh, you know, sort of perfect uh, uh, equal sharing. Any other questions? I have a very yes. simple, very simple yes. question. Yeah. Can I take a look at the slide before the slide, the final warning? Before this I, one? I, I, I need yes. something here. I hope I didn't say anything. To, uh, I wasn't trying to be controversial there. I was just, no, uh, no, no. <laughs> okay, fine. Yeah. <laughs> so, what happens uh, with with uh, the the uh, design or construction or, or introduction of models uh, in view of these uh, rapid changes taking place uh, in biology, in genetics, and so on, so forth, where maybe one day some serious uh, disease, maybe cancer and so on, uh, becomes curable and so on and so forth. We yeah. then need a different model to study this mortality uh, may just change. Well, you sort of think it's sort of still, I mean, if, you know, we're really doing sort of, you know, this, this CRISPR editing and we're sort of, 
getting, you know, this is somehow seems just so far away because, you know, all of the, you know, the, the image that we have here is just, you know, on the order of hundreds of deleterious mutations. It's not like, um, you know, sort of coming in and getting rid of the mutation for Huntington's disease or something like that, you know, something that's really going to have an obvious phenotypic effect and is going to sort of kill you, um, you know, before you reach middle age or something like that. These are sort of things that just make you kind of a little bit less efficient at the whole business of living. That's the sort of mutations that we're thinking of here rather than um, things that are having, you know, sort of major uh, obvious uh, effects as sort of what's driving this. I mean, obviously there's a, a spectrum, but it's, it's more, you know, large numbers of, 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 of small effect mutations rather than a small number of, uh, you know, rare but large effect when you do have the mutations. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Can I? Yeah. Oh, yeah, thanks. Something. Well, also we talk about this uh, exponential increase right. of mortality rate, right? So you are defining as uh, probably that you die right. in the following years, something like that. And of course, I don't know. I mean, I saw something like something that seemed to be contradictory, but of course, they had one can explain. Right. The other is that the life expectancy, your conditional life expectancy, increases with your age. Generally, Increases with your age, did yeah, you say? It's yeah. A bit bigger than the overall life expectancy. Right. Yes. Right. right. So on the other hand, well, the older you are, the probability you're going to die is going to increase. Right. So the probability. So it's a little bit of. Yeah, but that's sort of saying that you, if you, that the conditional expected value, given that you've lived to a certain age, is increasing. But the difference between that conditional expected value and the age that you've lived to is decreasing with with age. I mean, that's the the phenomenon. That's the whether you you know, you've got this increment and the, the expected value conditional expected value of the increments decreasing, but when you you know, sort of add it on to the, the the current age, still gives you something that increases. Yeah. Just like to uh, make a comment. I just noticed that that uh, Professor Steve Evans, his uh, surname, actually is the name of Evans Hall, the Mathematics and Statistics Department at Berkeley. I wonder what kind of connection that is. Uh, it's not every day that that uh, we see someone whose name is the same as that the building in which the person works, but. We'll actually have another colleague in mathematics, Craig Evans, the oh. wonderful partial differential equations guy, who, uh, you know, he shares the last name and he gets my mail every now and again and sort of <laughs> describes me as his evil twin. That's his, uh... okay. I'd like to uh, present a couple of appreciation on behalf of IMS to uh, Professor Evans. And this is the coffee mug. Oh, and, uh, thank you very much. For you to drink more coffee. Thank you very right. much. <laughs> yeah, probably don't. Thank you. Thank you. Should, I look at it, should I look at it now? Or? Uh, is that okay if I open it now? Okay. Thank you. And as we all know, uh, coffee goes very well with aging. So. <laughs> <laughs> We, we have coffee mugs with more different types. Uh, exactly, all different. I'm curious. This is what was that? You're all curious. Yes, I'm. I'm curious as well. <laughs> to see which one I've got. Each one comes with a design and name of the millennium problem, mathematical problem. Oh, well, this is, yes, it's so sort of is, uh, the, the Riemann zeta function. So. <laughs> Something that has a connection with probability, so there we go. Uh, yeah, next time we'll make a design test. Oh, no, I'm saying this does have a connection with probability. So oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah.
Okay. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, and thank you for coming. Good night. Thanks very much. Yeah. Yeah.